But on the, on the income inequality thing, we could talk about statistics. That's true. I could sit here and tell you that over the course of their lives, 56% of Americans at one time or another are in the top 10% of income earners in the U.S. Now, I dare say that is more mobility than we had in, you know, European history, let's say 300 years ago, 500 years ago, ever, probably, right? Very, very unlikely that a serf really rose that high or almost anybody, right? So that's just, that's just one fact. How about when you look at these studies that actually trace actual people? Usually you have studies that look at the bottom 20% here and the bottom 20% here, but they're different people. They're not different people. Joe Schmo, who was in the bottom 20% in 1996, Joe's in another one in 2005. That's the study I want to follow. Where did Joe go? What happened to Joe? The bottom 20%, they actually did a study. Bottom 20% in the decade 1996, 2005. But by the end of that decade, the bottom 20%, their incomes had nearly doubled. And the top income group saw their incomes fall by 26%. Now, that's not what we usually hear. No, it's not. But that's the truth. Um, and there, there, I, I had, a, again, I, Bob and I on Contra Krugman podcast, we did a whole episode on income inequality. So you can find that. Uh, it's uh, ContraKrugman.com. Anyway, you can also look at just overall conditions of the poor. Because, you know, Rothbard used to have this example. You know, he would say that eventually only a lunatic would care about income inequality. If it turned out that I have seven yachts and you have only five and you're still complaining, there's something the matter with you, okay? Just quit it. Enjoy your yachts and live out your happy life. So it is, it is worthwhile just to think about the absolute standard of how the poor are living. So the bottom 10% in the least capitalistic countries are earning something like barely $1,000 a year. Whereas in the most capitalistic countries, and this, you know, it's hard to measure this, but you can kind of figure it out, the bottom 10% are earning about $11,000 a year. You know, that's 11 time difference. That's something, right? That's the point. And it turns out, by the way, there's actually, if you measure income inequality using the Gini coefficient, there is less inequality in the most economically free countries than there, there is in the, in the least economically free. Uh, I got a whole bunch of these, but but you know what? To heck with them, because you can you can read them, you can find them, you can listen to the podcast. To me, what matters really is the overall improvement in the standard of living. It's been so extraordinary that the fact that you could sit up and say, "Well, that guy's getting richer just a little bit too fast for my taste," is just <laughs> it's just a lack of gratitude on a scale I can hardly imagine. So I'm going to give you this example. I got this from Deirdre McCloskey who says that in Burgundy, as recently as the 1840s, if you look at the men who worked in the vineyards, after the crop was in, in the autumn, they would go to bed and stay sleeping. They would, in effect, hibernate, all huddled up together to preserve their warmth during the winter because they could not afford the heat and they could not afford the food they'd have to consume if they got up and expended energy. That's the real human face of what we're talking about. That's gone, basically, for all intents and purposes. That's what we're talking about. These people now have luxuries people could not even have imagined. Could not even have imagined. In fact, sometimes when you watch The Twilight Zone and you look at what they consider to be futuristic, it's so clunky and stupid, you're laughing at them. They couldn't even have imagined what we have now. And you know, there are people who scoff at that and they say, oh, material things. Ha ha ha. Tell that to those people. You know, I, I think, or, you know, money can't buy you happiness. I bet it could have bought those people a little bit of happiness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you're telling me it doesn't buy happiness, then you go to Burgundy and sleep through the winter, you jerk. I'm sorry. I just, I'm in the middle of moving and I am in a foul mood, people. <laughs> Around 1800, the world income in modern terms, was about $3 a day. And I mean that's like $3 in your wallet right now. And you have to imagine how you would divide that up among all your needs. And then think, how could you live a life of spiritual and intellectual fulfillment under those conditions if you were lucky to survive at all? 
Are you going to be able to go join a local book club? Are you going to become an expert chess player? How is that possible? In that, that's a miserable existence. Don't tell me material things don't matter. That is a miserable existence. Now, that number is $33 a day, even when you include the most backward countries. And by backward countries, of course, I mean backward governments. $33 a day, an 11-fold increase. Wouldn't you think an 11-fold increase, the likes of which we've never seen, and by the way, in the major industrialized countries, it's more like $100 a day, and now you think to yourself, yeah, I could, if, I, if, if the chips were down, I could survive on $33 a day. I could. I could survive on $100 a day. Plenty of people do. With that kind of unprecedented change, the fact that you could even think about Income inequality, it just boggles my mind. Now, yes, I know, if the super rich people got that way because of the Fed or the government, then yeah, that's right. Take it all away. I agree. You're right. The point is, be happy with what you have, you know? I mean, wh who's, that, uh, who's that singer who she used to be married to that uh, steroid bicycle guy? I can't. Cheryl, Crow. Cheryl Crow. Doesn't she have a song where she says you got to want what you have or some kind of thing like that something like that i don't know i don't listen to your i don't listen to your young youngster music actually that's already oldster music now isn't it yeah. that's when you know it's time to wrap up well the marxists say that the market pits classes against each other but obviously the state pits classes against each other in the market, we have all these voluntary interactions, and on the, in the state, we have coercion and hangmen and everything else that, that Mises described. The International Division of Labor is the greatest assembly of human cooperation ever seen in history. Now, what are we up against, we who believe that society seems to just work? It can just work. All the major ingredients just work. Well, let's see. We're only up against the whole world, by my reckoning. We're up against the politicians who exist in order to contradict us on this point. We're up against the media. We're up against the, the, the media and the, the movies, which can find all kinds of private sector villains, but never a government villain, unless he's a sort of free market guy. But then they, even then, they never quite get the free market guy right. Like on that show, Family Ties in the 80s. Alex Keaton was supposed to be the conservative, and he's got a portrait of Nixon by his bed. They, they, they don't even get what a, a young Republican would. At least I knew young Republicans. None of them had a Nixon. I mean, they, they were not good for other reasons, but they, at least they were better than that. <laughs> You're up against the, the schools that exist to say, hey, where would you be without all the political, you know, without the political class? So we are very much the underdog. But you know what? People love the underdog, and the underdog surprises you once in a while. And among underdogs, the Institute has been an underdog. The Institute does not have billionaire donors. It's not located in Washington, D.C., thank heavens. It does not get, uh, you know, in invitations from government officials, nor does it extend any. And yet, it goes to show that if you quietly and diligently do your work and stay faithful, things happen. Now, my advice to you this week is to work and pay attention. You'll be tempted to check your email, check your Twitter feed, and I'm begging you not to do that. Get your questions answered in person by this faculty. This is a lot of fun this week, no question about it. But we're also doing something very serious here. We're training the next generation of dissident intellectuals, people who will communicate and build upon these great ideas. So let your efforts be worthy of the great tradition of scholarship represented here. You know, whenever I hear the expression, children, the children are our future, for some reason, that sends a chill up my spine. I'm not exactly sure why. <laughs> but if those of you in this room are our future, well, then we can look forward to it with confidence. Thank you.